Good morning. Welcome to Hope Community Church. Um, would you please stand and worship with us?
Father God, we just thank you for this morning and the opportunity to come together as your people and your church and just worship you, Father. Um, we lay it all at your feet this morning. We give it all to you. Um, yeah, thank you for worship.
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the only love, every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
will not be just voices. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
you Amen Before you guys get seated um, There's a lot of new people here um, So just say hi to your neighbor If you see a new face Maybe introduce yourself um, But yeah Thanks for worshiping with us <laughs> So good to see so many of you gathered here in this space this morning, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. Um, And uh, just uh, for those of you who are fairly new to Hope, a couple of things to try and help you to get better connected with us. The easiest uh, place to to, to go to learn more about us, of course, is the church website. Many of you probably have already been there. Uh, But then when you get to the website, uh, the uh, two yellow circles are, are helpful resources to you. So maybe the first thing you want to do is just sign up to get the e-newsletter. And um, I just asked Laura this past week, I'm like, you know, when I make this announcement, does anybody do anything with this? And she said, yeah, actually, in the past couple of months, we've had over 28 people sign up for the church newsletter. So I guess like, okay, so people are responding to that. When you do sign up for the newsletter, at the bottom of the newsletter, it tells you how to sign up for the church app. Um, and to download the app to your phone. It just becomes a good resource to you. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you and invite you to do that. And for those of you who are fairly new and connecting to Hope and maybe kind of feeling like you are connecting here, um, it's helpful if you'd like us to know of your contact info for you to make that available and let us know at the office that that info can be made available more broadly. So for example, this past week I was looking for an address for one of you who've been fairly regularly attending here, and I went to the church directory, uh, which is a great resource, but I couldn't find the address. So if you could put that info and make it available to us, that would be, that'd be great if um, you're in that uh, place where you're feeling like hope is a place that you're connecting and you'd want to make that available to others. Um, uh, a couple more things for those of you who are fairly new this morning, uh, right after this service, Um, In between services, there's a gathering in Classroom 3. It's just an opportunity for those of you who are fairly new to Hope to uh, meet other folks, uh, other leaders. Um, It's not a long thing. It's just an opportunity to meet and greet a few other people and find out just a little bit more about the church and get connected with a few people so you feel like you're not like just all alone, but you know a face or two. So we invite you to check check that out. And then lastly, for those of you who are actually here in the service, Um, There's a connection card on the bulletin, and you can use that as a a way of communicating here at the church as well. Um, So today we just started a new class. It's taking place right now at Financial Peace University, and if you had intended to sign up, but you didn't sign up, and you are here right now, and you say, you know, I really want to participate in that, feel free to get up at any point and just go to the classroom. There's uh, there's more than a dozen people in there right now, and uh, they'd be glad to, uh, to, to have a few other folks Uh, participate as well. All right, kids, I'm going to let you guys head out to your class. And uh, for those of you who are new to Hope, uh, you can follow the crowd. Parents, if you want your kids, sixth grade and under, to participate in Kingdom Kids this morning. Uh, There's lots of adult leaders uh, that will be glad to answer questions and help you navigate the uh, process of getting newly connected uh, to one of our classes. But while they're headed out, this morning we are going to be introducing some new members. Um, We have a bunch of people, I think maybe about 12 people who went through the About Hope class in the month of May, and three of those folks uh, have made the decision to uh, become members at Hope Community Church. And what does membership mean at Hope Community Church? Essentially, membership means that I say, hey, I agree with the vision, the mission, the values, the beliefs of Hope Community Church, Not only do I believe them and hold on to them, but I want to help advance them. I want to be a part of helping the church accomplish its vision and mission. And uh, just as a reminder, our vision at Hope is to be internally strong and to be externally focused. 
And when we talk about that as a vision, what I want you to grab is that our vision is not static. It is about movement. It's about becoming something that we currently are not. Nobody is internally strong, and nobody is always externally focused. But we are in this process of becoming stronger on the inside, and we're in this process of reaching people who are not yet connected to Jesus. So maybe the way to say it, the way that we say it in our mission is for us to become like Jesus to help others become like Jesus. Now our logo kind of captures all of this. So when you look at the logo, um, you notice there's eight arrows. Some people, when they look at the logo, they say, I only see four arrows. I see the red, the blue, the green, um, the, the, the gray. But in fact, there's eight arrows. If you look very carefully at the logo, you also see there's four white arrows. And those white arrows are pointing to the inside. Those four white arrows capture this idea that we want to be internally strong. We want to be strong on the inside. And when we talk about being internally strong, what we mean is that um, you need to know Jesus and his word. That's where it all begins. It begins in your relationship with Jesus, getting to know who Jesus is and his word. So he speaks to us through the Bible. And then next we talk about being transformed into his likeness. There's no better person to be more like than Jesus. I invite you to think about anybody you can think of. And as great and as famous and as amazing those people are, Jesus is better. Jesus outdoes them. And there's no better person for us to be like than to be like Jesus. So to be transformed into his likeness. Then we talk about doing what it is that he made us to do and then being connected in meaningful relationships. And what I want you to know about all this is it takes intention on the part of each one of us. And as we are intentional at each of these things, then we become stronger on the inside. But it requires us to act, to do something with our gifts, to do something and being connected. It's not just about gathering information and knowledge. It's about applying that. That's how we become internally strong. And then our vision, the next part of it says, we, we want to be externally focused. We believe that Jesus called us and invites us in his mission to make more disciples, which means we, we can't be focused on ourselves. We've got to be focused on others who don't know Jesus. And so this is Jesus' vision. It's not our vision. It's Jesus' mission for us to become more like him so that we can help others become like him. But when we talk about being externally focused, you see the four words there, the four arrows that go with it. Joining in God's mission, we believe that Jesus is at work right now in our community. Last week, we baptized three individuals. Several of them, I said, I, I, don't, I, I, haven't, I didn't know you until just recently. But I've been praying for you because I've been praying for our community and people in our community who don't yet know Jesus. And Jesus is at work in people's lives, and he's enabled us to connect with those folks that we baptized last week and to develop relationship with them. As God was at work in their lives, we are connecting with them. That's what it means to join in his mission. And then sharing the hope of the whole gospel, recognizing that the, 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 the people have needs, they have physical needs as much as they have spiritual needs, and we're called to meet those needs as a church. And then helping people who have needs, and in particular, the orphan, the poor, and the fatherless. God speaks so much about our responsibility to engage in those things. And we have many ministries here at Hope that help us in that. And then lastly, partnering with others. So this is our vision. It's our mission as a church. And when you go through the About Hope class, we talk about these things in great length. But today we're introducing some new members who say, hey, we, we own this vision and we want to help it to become reality at Hope Community Church. And so today we welcome David Spade. Um, David has been a part of Hope for a number of years. Um, after graduating from college, he connected with us. Before college, he actually was part of uh, our youth ministry. Um, but David has a heart for students. Uh, it's been really cool to watch what God has been doing in David's life in the past couple of years since graduation from college and his investment here at Hope. So David gives um, leadership um, to Explosion Youth on Tuesdays. He leads a, a small group. He um, helps to give leadership to Digging Deeper, which is on Sunday evenings, students who gather in a local home and they dig deeper into God's word. And David's given leadership to that. 
He's not alone. There's others involved in Explosion Youth, but that's uh, how David's been involved here at Hope. And then next we have uh, Matt and Lauren Updegrove. And Matt and Lauren have been a part of, part of Hope for, I don't know, probably about four years, uh, serving a ton in Kingdom Kids. I have huge hearts for kids, investing in kids, serving in Awana on Wednesdays, um, and also opening their home to host a missional community and to give some leadership to that. And so we welcome these, um, these families uh, to, to, um, to membership here at Hope, and this is what they're committing to. Those that are members commit to this. So go to the next slide, please. To purposefully strive as a member to fulfill the vision of being internally strong and externally focused. So they, they've said, this is what I'm about. I'm, 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 I'm going to live on purpose in this way. To purposely strive to be a faithful steward of their financial resources through investing in the ministries of hope as well as other ministries. To uh, use their unique spiritual gifts to recognize that they've been given something and they're going to do what God made them to do as a minister of Jesus to serve consistently with excellence in at least one ministry capacity within the ministry of hope. And then lastly, to be externally focused, to be salt and light within the surrounding community and purposely participating in at least one organization, club, activity, some way, connecting in relationships with children or adults in our community. And um, so we welcome this morning David Spade, Matt, and Lauren Updegrove into membership of Hope Community Church. And if you just wouldn't mind giving them applause, that'd be great. All right, so um, a lot of announcements there, important ones, um, that are who we are as a church. And as we now transition into the message this morning, I'm going to invite Rod Fry to come on up. Um, Rod is one of our ministry partners. We talked about being externally focused and partnering with others. Rod is a ministry partner of ours. He's been a ministry partner for the past 20-some years. Yes. And... Um, not only is Rod a ministry partner, but he's a personal friend of mine. Um, so I have counted a privilege to have been able to, uh, to work alongside, serve with Rod several times over the past couple of years, uh, making trips to uh, Mexico where Rod and his wife Maida and three children live and serve and minister. Um, but over the years to just develop a relationship with, uh, with you and your wife, it's been, it's been fantastic and a privilege. But um, Rod, why don't you introduce yourself, your wife, your kids, and tell us a little bit about, about who you are and, and your ministry. Sure. Well, I grew up here in Elizabethtown um, and uh, went to Moody Bible Institute, and after that went to Mexico, and soon after that met my beautiful wife. She's right there, Maida, and uh, with three kids, all three of them born in Mexico City, and uh, kind of an interesting process with missionary experience. You think of um, a missionary leaving for the first time to go to the field as kind of a real difficult transition. For, for us as a family, another difficult transition has been to see all our three kids um, come back and live in, in Elizabethtown and kind of leave us in Mexico. So that's been interesting. But uh, um, because of, of this past year and the uniqueness of COVID, uh, we had initially decided well, we initially came up for uh, a less period of time, but decided to extend our time. So uh, we expect to go back to Mexico within the next month or so. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what, what you've been doing over the past year. Uh, over the past year, well, we've been involved with uh, Cornerstone. Well, initially, we were visiting a number of uh, different supporting churches in Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, and then uh, got involved with local ministry here, doing pulpit supply, involved with Cornerstone uh, starting a, a young adult ministry um, and, uh, and many different different things. Uh, most recently, I've been kind of uh, my side hustle has been um, transporting uh, medical patients uh, part time. So that's been uh, that's been that's been a neat experience as well. Cool. So um, you you mentioned that in the future, near future, you have some plans. To talk a little bit more about. Just what your intents are? Yeah, well, um, actually, you know, I mentioned COVID in Mexico. Uh, they uh, actually have gone, after the kids being out of school for the better part of a year, they went back to school for about a month and now have gone back to online learning. So uh, COVID is very much an issue there. But we expect to go back soon and then um, be involved in the next, especially in the next two years with uh, a lot of short-term ministry. Matter of fact, Hope has been visiting us before, and it'd be great to do to see you back again. 
Uh, there's a group from Grace College um, in Indiana coming to visit us as a minister in our ministry uh, place there um, in December, and so uh, looking forward to going back to the church planning situation that we're involved with there. Yeah, and uh, just real quickly on that, uh, you you guys have been planting churches. Um, mm -hmm. Right as a vision for seven seven churches in this community, it's it's amazing to stand up on this mountain and just kind of look over Mexico City, like 24 million people that live there. Um, but um, you've plant we've planted three churches, leadership in three churches, um, and the, the most recent has been this third church plant yeah, in the past two years. And we had hope of gone down and assisted and helped in, in um, the planting of these churches, um, being involved in encouraging leaders. And, and um, so it's it's been fantastic, and we do look forward to coming back. Um, That'd be great. So um, with that, I'm just going to turn over the morning. I've, I've invited Rod to come in and talk to us about relationships um, as we look at the next passage in Ecclesiastes, um, especially from the standpoint of Mexicans do such a better job at um, relationship than what we do um, in terms of just like um, welcoming others, um, yeah, including most, them. Most and so I'll let you just kind of take over and, 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 and encourage us with those things. Very different culture. Yeah, I, I mentioned my, my side hustle in transporting uh, people with dialysis needs and medical, um, medical issues. This past Wednesday, I uh, picked up a resident from a place in York called Pleasant Acres Nursing and Re Rehabilitation Center, and um, her name was Brenda, and she mentioned that the place had a history. I actually looked up the history of this place. It was initially a poorhouse, like an almshouse in the early 1900s, then it became an a sane asylum for a while, and now it's, now it's a rehabilitation and nursing center. But anyway, I picked up Brenda, and in the 19 or so minutes that I had from um, that uh, her resident on the on the residence on the third floor, basically one room, uh, to the dialysis center, she told me all about herself. And several times she apologized for talking so much. She really didn't have the opportunity to talk to people that much. But on the way there, she told me that uh, her she was part of a family and she was one of eight kids. And I was never, I don't know if I've ever heard of this before, but her parents actually gave away all eight kids to other families. And for some reason, they kept her, and her mother wanted to keep her to Christmas uh, because her mother wanted to give her a special gift. And there was already a family that has, had decided that had expressed their willingness to take Brenda. But uh, her mother wanted to, to give her this Christmas gift, and so Christmas came, and her mom gave her an unwrapped cardboard gift, cardboard box, with a dirty doll in it with half the hair pulled out. And she said, Mom, why would you keep me to Christmas to give me this? That was on the way to dialysis. On the way back from dialysis, she told me that she had a house, that her granddaughter and her boyfriend lived in the house with her and that initially her, grand, her granddaughter's boyfriend was kind to her, but as time went on, he began to become abusive, both physically and verbally, and, and called her old and fat and ugly and worse. And so she ended up in Pleasant Acres with a one-room resident basically spending most of her social security every month to be there. And so in those 19 minutes that it took her, that I was with her for those three times a week visits to a dialysis center, I heard a story, a unique, a sad, and a wonderful story from Brenda. Everyone has a story, and everyone needs to tell somebody about that. It's um, great to be with you. I'm excited about being part of this uh, series in What Are You Chasing? In Ecclesiastes, the teacher uh, has a lot of themes that are very relevant for our lives, lives today, aren't they? Um, it's been fun to follow along online and, and, uh, and hear some of the teachings uh, that have come before this. And today we're talking about relationships, 
Our text is Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 12. If you are still one of those curious creatures that carry your Bibles with you, you can find it in Ecclesiastes 4. We're going to look at 7 through 12, and it says this. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. Verse 10, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, this Sunday is going to be a little different because we're going to be talking about relationships, and Solomon doesn't say that relationships are meaningless or that all of all is vanity. So it's a bit of a departure from some of the themes, perhaps. It's, but it, King Solomon is not critical of, of not having any relationships, but he is critical of being alone and living alone, of, of, of being kind of that solitary person. Um, you know, independence is overrated. Those first, those first two verses there, Solomon does return to his theme of, being, of some things being vanity, right? A miserable business. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. For whom am I toiling and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? Now, we talk about independence and, you know, as a culture, we kind of like independence, don't we? Matter of fact, COVID has encouraged independence. This year has, past year has been crazy for normal relationships and tragic for already challenged relationships, hasn't it? And we all have our stories. According to marriage and family therapist Lindsay Kramer, the stress of the pandemic has put us in a prolonged period of tension, which she calls a state of suspended angst wondering when things will ever return to what we know as normal, constantly waiting for things to get better or having to brace for the worst. It's a tremendous impact on our physical and mental health, activities of daily living and relationships. I talk to young adults, that college students, and they're like, you know, I've gotten so used to Zoom that I'm not even sure I want to be necessarily with a group of people anymore. Well, that's certainly not the reaction of most people. I was at the first Barnstormers game of the season, and everybody was out there, right? And I think they're, generally speaking, most of us want to want to be with people. Um, but there's certainly an impact that COVID has caused, and some things will never be the same, right? Work from home. Are we all going to get back to the office, or perhaps not, right? Technology has encouraged that independent sort of isolated mindset, doesn't it? Here we have somebody walking into a pole there. I don't know if the picture is very clear, but uh, if you've seen any of those short videos, you know, the TikTok videos of stupid people, technology is a big part of that, right? Walking into cars, <laughs> almost getting hit by cars, walking into poles. Um, laughs um, the brother here as he's watching his phone, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding there. Um, but, you know, we're, we're into that, aren't we? Um, and, and don't tell me that it's just the teenagers. Uh, check your screen time for the last year, the last week, your average screen time. Do you ever get concerned about that when it goes over, you know, three or four hours? Um, at Cornerstone, I fairly frequently survey the kids. And what do you think are the most popular apps right now? YouTube is the number one, according to this little survey I did. Second one, Snapchat. Third one, TikTok. If you use Facebook, you are officially old. Uh, and, and if you think about those apps that I mentioned, they're all just little blips, little blips of, of dopamine, right? The little hits. And... Um, 
It's difficult to pay attention when your diet is that. Some of the kids admitted that, this one kid admitted to me that he is on average on TikTok between three and four hours a day. One app. And another survey I did had a couple people, a couple kids being on their phones between 11 and 13 hours a day, screen time. Now, before we say, oh, well, it makes me look good, <laughs> I think we all need to evaluate how much we are becoming absorbed by our technology. And our culture highly values it, right? Our culture really high, highly values it. You look at the lone hero, the guy who doesn't take any trouble from anybody, right? who is self-sufficient, borderline rebellious, and strong. And before you say, that's not me, think of how horrible it was. It would be if you were dependent upon somebody. We don't like that at all. Matter of fact, we make jokes about codependent people, don't we? We don't like to be dependent upon anybody. Now, if I were to ask you, which, is, which has the, the greater potential of, of being a sin, being dependent or being independent? What do you think? What would Jesus say as he, as he brought a child into his lap and said, you need to become like this child to enter the kingdom of heaven? So this sense of independence is something that is a big part of us and a big part of the culture, social, solitude and social isolation increases the risk of mental health issues like depression, anxiety, substance abuse, as well as chronic conditions of like high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes. We're not meant to be alone. In his book, The Power of Strangers, studies have found epidemic levels of loneliness in the United States and the United Kingdom affecting everyone, but especially the young who, in a remarkable development, report levels of loneliness that surpass even those of the elderly. And loneliness, medical researchers have found, is as bad for you as smoking, making it a bona fide public health threat. In my new uh, job, I meet lonely elderly people, some of which have not left the rehab center in a year. But what's this say? Young people, too, are lonely. And how can that be? When you put an Instagram picture up and, and 500 people like it, does that ever amaze anybody else? I have kids that put an Instagram picture up and everybody's liking this thing. And they complain about how they don't have any friends, right? How is that? Reminds me of the cartoon I saw once where uh, it's, it's a way, it's a funeral, and well, there's only two people there, and one says to the other, boy, I thought there'd be a lot more people here. He had like 1,500 friends on Facebook. In the United Kingdom, they appointed their, fir they appointed their first loneliness minister, a high-ranking government official who steers policy geared towards repairing frayed social ties. Solomon agrees. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. This too is meaningless, a miserable business. The topic of relationships is very relevant to me, and I have a, a unique perspective because I grew up in Elizabethtown and was here till I went to, to Moody, to Chicago, came back, but basically been in Mexico now for a little bit more than half of my life. Now, I'm 54, you can do the math. So, and I've been back here for the last, you know, better part of a year, so all of this is like very, you know, I can put two things very clearly side by side and say, wow, what a difference. This culture is constructed in such a way that it motivates you to be busy here in the U.S. And, and also, as a culture, we don't know what to do with, with free moments. What we don't do, usually, almost always, is say, oh, who can I go visit instead of watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy? I'll just stop in and maybe 
I don't know, sit in the porch with somebody. Maybe I'll go and have a cup of coffee with somebody. Do you ever do that? Honestly? No, you don't. When we left our kids up here, our kids would say, Mom and Dad, you don't understand. People here don't have any margin for anybody outside of maybe their immediate families. Would you agree with that? Think about how impossible it is in this culture to be spontaneous about anything. And you guys are like, no, I'm a spontaneous person. No, you're not. In Mexico, if we were to send a WhatsApp, which nobody uses, well, more people use WhatsApp than Facebook Messenger. Of course, Facebook owns WhatsApp, so it doesn't really matter, right? But we send a WhatsApp to members of our church congregation. It doesn't matter what, what age they are. And let's say it's a Wednesday. Let's say it's a Thursday. Let's say it's a Friday. Hey, we're going to have, we're going to open up our house on Saturday. And just, you know, just feel free to drop in and, and, and we'll have something to eat here. And, and, you know, I guarantee you we'd have 20 people, at least. You do that here? Huh. Nobody's going to come to your house. What are you doing? Inviting us so late, we already have plans, don't, don't you know that? And if you don't have plans, you're not going to admit it because then you're a loser. And then we're Lancaster County people, right? And we have this work ethic. And we think that if, like, talking to people, well, that's, you know, I don't, that's not work. I mean, I don't want to be called a slacker. You know, if somebody spots me just talking to people, you know, that's, you know, maybe once or twice, but after a while, they're going to think that, you know, I'm a... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that must be striking a chord here. <laughs> that whole Lancaster County work ethic, I don't know. It's, it's... But you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Now, in, if you are in Mexico, and those of you who have gone to Mexico know this, um, and it's, it's kind of fun for a week, and, you know, but, you know, I live there. So, but, but anyway, you can't, if somebody invites you to their house after Sunday service, um, you're going to be there the rest of the day, all right? Um, last night, we had a drop-in for my son, it was his graduation party, and a drop-in works here, but it, a drop-in in Mexico is not a drop-in. It's a drop-in and stay, and you don't drop out until, like, you know, midnight. <laughs> and, and you're thinking, I have these people in my home, and hey, it's a school night. It doesn't matter if it's a school night. I don't have any, th I'm out of things to say. No, you're not out of things to say. There's always something to talk about. You don't just drop off something at somebody's house because they're going to invite you in. They're going to send their little kid to get a three-liter bottle of Mexican Coke, and you're going to be there for a while. Sometimes when we have a house full of people, I go to the bathroom just to escape. <laughs> and, and I ask myself sometimes, this whole concept of introvert and extrovert, is that biblical? Now, sorry to offend, like, probably more than half of you right there. Well, I'm an introvert. Well, give me chapter and verse. There's parts of life that being a disciple require us to perhaps extend ourselves beyond where we're comfortable. Effectiveness in overseas ministry, the Canadian International Development Agency connected a study, and they're talking about all kinds of people, people that are involved with relief work, people that are involved with oil fields, people that are involved with businesses, and all around the world. And what's the, what's the most, what's the key element of being effective in another culture? You know what it is? The most powerful factor in overseas effectiveness, oh, we lost the, huh. oh, it's okay, I'll just, you know, it's all right. The most powerful effect factor in overseas effectiveness was the ability to initiate and sustain 
interpersonal relationships with the local people. So if you're sending out a missionary, it doesn't matter necessarily that they know everything. But when they get to that culture, they're able to relate to people. They're able to love people. They're able to talk to people. And they don't put up, they don't put up walls. They don't, they don't live in a secured area all the time. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's talk about our culture. Do you think that maybe as Christians, a big part of our effectiveness in sharing the gospel is our ability to initiate and sustain relationships? Maybe. Think about it. Now, relationships are beneficial. That's the rest of this passage. The first two verses, Solomon says, being alone isn't good. But then he says in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Have you ever done a worksheet, maybe in a leadership group, where they have this scenario where you are in a desert and you only can pick five or ten things from a list of 25 things. Have you ever done those sorts of exercises? And, you know, I, I'm a boy, I kind of grew up kind of boy scoutish. I always, always, so, you know, I'm picking this list and I'm, I'm like, I am sure that, you know, you need, you need a mat, you need matches more than you need a knife and you need this more than you need that. And, 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 and so I, you know, I picked out my items, but guess what? When you combine the perspectives of other people, almost always you're going to have a better chance of surviving in that scenario. In other words, other people's perspectives add to the success of, of this project. So there's a synergy. There's a synergy in relationships, right? One horse can pull six to 7,000 pounds. Two horses can pull 18,000 pounds. That's more than double, and two horses trained to pull together can pull 25,000 pounds. There's a synergy about working together, right? What about a sports team? Have you ever been on a sports team? Um, we need to see this picture. There you go. That's a picture of my son right there at the number 34. And have you ever like played a sp in sports and and you get in the zone, right? Some people call it flow. And professional athletes have talked about this, and it's like time stands still, and you like almost know what's ahead. That synergy that happens when we work with other people. What about, what about in ministry? What, if, what, what about when we hit that, great is the Lord, right? When we come together with the worship team here and something special happens, you can't do that by yourself. What about these groups that have gone to Mexico and like every single person that's on that team was there for a reason and you're glad they went and they benefited from it and they learned something from it. I'm sure you can give your own examples. Relationships produce synergy. What's another thing that they, they, they do? Verse 10, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. This past April, an 84-year-old man was found dead in a pond Saturday, uh, in one Saturday in Lancaster County. And the Pennsylvania State Police uh, responded to Pensy Road in Martique Township it's in the report of this 83-year-old missing man and they found an unattended boat on a pond within the property and eventually found the man in the pond. And, and the moral of the story is, is not, don't fish. <laughs> the moral of the story is, whether you're 84 or 48 or 18 or 8, it's dangerous, isn't it, to be totally alone. It's not healthy. We get support by being with others. Some of us are blessed to be married. Some of us have been married a long time. And some of you even start looking physically, looking like your, your partners. Have you ever noticed that? The next slide there. 
Uh, do you, you guys like this movie? You know? Maybe God knew that long-term commitment such as marriage isn't meaningless and that long-term friendship is a tremendous blessing. My dad graduated around 64, maybe. He still meets with people he graduated with, like once a month. Elizabethtown High School, John Fry, class of 64, maybe? 60, something like that. It's pretty amazing. Matter of fact, I almost tend to think that older generations might do relationships better than younger ones. Because they didn't have to deal with social media. They actually had to talk to people. Do you know people that don't like to even talk on the phone anymore? It's like texting or emails, and some of us can fall into that, can't we? It's like, I don't want to be bothered by talking to people. <laughs> really? Is that really healthy? Verse 11, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? So solidarity or, or partnership or friendship, right? There was a single guy who helped us in the ministry uh, in Mexico City. Uh, this is back 2000, 2002. Um, he was a DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary graduate, and um, worked with us as a single guy, saw Black Hawk down and decided he wanted to be a Special Forces Ranger. I'm not sure how that movie would motivate you to do that, but... Um, and he told us stories about his training, and those of you who know a little bit about, you know, you have the, the Fort Benning phase, the mountain phase a, a, in North Georgia, and then the swamp phase at Camp James in the Florida Panhandle. And he told us that he literally... They literally had to sleep on top of one another to keep warm enough. He said, when we would go through that, we would always, we would always stand close enough, close to each other. We would form a circle, and the person in the middle would cycle out just to keep warm. He said, there's no, there's no shame. There's, there was no shame. And I, he said, we would literally lay on top a pyramid, two guys on the bottom and a guy on the top, just to try to keep warm. In that training over the years, since 1952, 56 ranger students have died, seven of hypothermia, in the training. So when you think about keeping warm, um, some of you are thinking maybe marriage, but imagine if you're a ranger. Linda is a dialysis patient in Wyoming, and many, many, like many people, goes to dialysis three times a week, and for several weeks she had an early morning appointment, and she began her treatment as early as 5.30, which meant that I started work at 4.30, which meant that I had to wake up at 3.30. And um, I would pick her up, and, and I transported her fairly often, and every week without fail, her husband would show up at the dialysis center. And dialysis is rough. You know, you're hooked up to a machine for three to four hours. After dialysis, you're actually physically cold because your blood cools during that time. And Linda and her husband explained that dialysis was actually a blessing for them because even though the nursing home was totally closed to them all through COVID for over a year, at least they could see each other during dialysis times. Huh. That's pretty cool, isn't it? What's another value of relationships? It's protection or strength. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, verse 12. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Does someone have your back when things get dicey? Are there people that you know you can depend on when the going gets rough? My son was, he was an angry football, football player. Uh, passionate, but uh, he defended the Hispanics, right? And he would say to anybody who messed with like the one Hispanic or two Hispanic players, you mess with them, you mess with me. And you, you have to understand that my son learned football in Mexico where it's different. <laughs> 
it's different. And so he was, had no problem, like, going, you know, helmet to helmet and, like, giving somebody a concussion and probably himself. A few years ago, our, our Dodge journey was carjacked. Two young men came at Maida from behind with guns. Just so happened that a neighbor of Maida's mother worked in the state attorney's general's office. It just so happened that the principal's husband of where David went to school had connections with the local police force. It just so happened that we got our van back in record time. But what if we hadn't had those connections? One of the purposes of a family is strength, is it not? And maybe one of the purposes of a church is strength. The spiritual community of a church makes us stronger. We belong to something. We have each other's back. And it should give us a tremendous amount of support to know that Jesus also is with us, even though we cannot see him. Think about all the one another's in the Bible. Love one another, edify one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, serve one another, pray for one another, honor one another, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens, be patient with one another, submit to one another, show hospitality to one another. And you can, you can be at home watching, you know, Francis Chan and Alistair Begg and all these great preachers on a Sunday, but you're not gonna you're not gonna get any of that. You're not gonna get any of that. We need to be here. And that's why the author of Hebrews perhaps said, "Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together." Right? There's something about it. The Lord is also always with us. Sometimes we forget that. This next, uh, these two pictures um, are recent within the last two weeks. Uh, Martin Mendez is one of the pastors of the First Church where we minister. Martin is a phenomenally diligent person. (laughs) Kirk Kirk and Valerie could tell stories about Martin and his wife, Laura. Through COVID, I think probably Martin's church has actually grown because Martin goes, oh, well, people don't can't come to church, that's okay. I can, you know, invade their homes through Zoom, and he does. And so he was up in northern Mexico on a job. He has a secular job doing Zoom through his phone to some of the people in the church. And they had this accident soon after that. And the woman, one of the women that received, that was doing the Zoom Bible study, she was told, hey, pray for Martine and, and uh, I forget the other person that was with them in the car because they just had this accident. And the woman said, well, how are the three of them doing? Well, there was only two people in the car, but on the Zoom, guess how many people she saw? <laughs> there was somebody in the back seat apparently. It wasn't them. And they walked away from this accident. The car didn't do very well. Jesus is always with us. So how can we apply this? Solomon says, it's not great to be alone. Don't be isolated. Don't, Don't be absorbed with playing six hours of modern warfare. Don't be absorbed with watching four or five hours, of, except if it's the fifth game of the NBA playoffs, that's okay, we'll watch that, but, but don't watch, did you see that, by the way, that last minute alley-oop, bam, that was great, but um, sorry if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, but don't waste your life in front of a TV or in front of your phone. Solomon is saying, don't be isolated, don't isolate yourself. Practice hospitality. Uh, a great book uh, that we use is kind of a, a book that, that we study when, when, when people come down to Mexico is, is Cross-Cultural Servanthood by Dwayne Elmer. 
Hospitality, how hospitality is extending love to those we don't know and who may be different, a different ethnic or cultural history. It is the idea of being gracious to all people, welcoming them into your presence and making them feel valued. Um, do you open up your home? Uh, when's the last time somebody that wasn't your son or daughter slept in your home? Uh, See, we don't even we don't have a culture of hospitality, do we? We nobody visits us. <laughs> we'll send them to a hotel, won't we? Often. Um, what about inviting people to our homes that maybe we don't know real well, or maybe that we don't even like? Um, that's one area in this culture that we still have, right? As a church. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Some people in Mexico think that you've been angels. I quickly correct them. I'm just kidding. How else? Be intentional and engaged in relationships. Visit the shut-ins, care for the widow, greet the stranger. Love everyone. How can we make this practical? How can we become more focused on actually developing relationships with others? Well, for those people that we may already know, why not spend a little bit more time with them? Why not have porch times or coffee times or let's go down to the river times or I don't know, but it's, it shouldn't be that difficult. <laughs> Can we do that? Can we initiate and sustain relationships with maybe people we don't know? Can we talk to strangers? Can we reach out in the name of Jesus? And finally, let's remember that people are eternal. You know, Solomon in this book was kind of mixed up, wasn't he? Well, did the spirit of a man, and a human go up or down? Maybe we're all the same as animals. And, you know, he was... But I think even he would recognize, finally, because at the end of the book, he does kind of come around and say, you need to fear God, Right? Because one day we're going to meet him. People are eternal. People are not meaningless. People are not a breath. People are not vanity. People last forever. So how are we doing? Is there something that we perhaps can think of what we can do this week? to reach out and to be a bit more intentional in both the quantity and quality of our relationships. May God, may God help us do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Ecclesiastes. Um, so relevant to where we are and where we live. Father, I pray that as as Jesus just seems like he was around people a lot. And, and sure, yeah, he had those times where he withdrew. Uh, and we need that too. But I pray that you would encourage us to go beyond ourselves perhaps and reach out in the name of Jesus, in your name. All right, hey, well, thank you for generally paying attention. Some of you had lapses. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, may the Lord help us to uh, remember some of these, these uh, principles that we see in his word uh, during this next week. And you are dismissed.